Hi, it's Dennis Daly. I've posted over 100 excerpts from some of my more than 250 American montage shows that I did in the 1980s and 90s while at UPI Radio. Recently, I embarked on a fresh series of shows. We're on the road this week in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, and we could do a show just on this city. It's one of the nicest and prettiest places I've ever been, and it's full of surprises. John Goss is my host. He has taken an old movie theater and made it a vaudeville palace that's attracting rave reviews and standing room only on weekends. John, thanks for having us here. I must say, this is the first time I think I've ever done American Montage with an audience. <laughs> kind of nice. But that, that is something you should hear because we're in a theater. Yes, we hear a lot of that around you. Very good. <laughs> Before we talk about this wonderful place here in Glenwood Springs, Colorado, let's talk about you. Where, where are you from originally? I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I uh, started a boy choir in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It got me involved in singing. I realized I had a really good ear and I kind of took off and got good at that. And then I just auditioned for the community theater when I was really young. Next thing I knew, 20 shows later, I was, I was sucked into it and getting my degree in it and cared about a lot and started performing. Is there any other business that is as addictive as performing? <laughs> I mean, for example, my first Great college question. scholarship was not in journalism. It was in voice. But I couldn't use the scholarship because to also do journalism, they were both so time intensive right. that I couldn't do both. So I went into journalism. Right. But I, I realize I still perform at karaoke twice a week. Now, nice. before people go to the restroom here, when you hear the word karaoke, where I live in Palm Springs, California, there are some phenomenal singers there. Absolutely. And, and I find that either getting up and making a speech, which I do for civic clubs, or singing is something I almost have to do. Yeah. Like doing this radio show. Yeah. You know, this it's, is performing for me. Yeah, it's a release. It's an artistic, creative release. And so you were about how old then when you thought, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to pursue this? I would say I was in my, my teens, my mid-teens, because mm -hmm. I found I was pretty darn good at it. <clears throat> and then I started in other areas of theater and dancing and acting and doing other stuff and found, hey, uh, it's the only thing I was really good at and the only thing I really loved when I was younger and started doing it at school and realized I got a little bit of a scholarship to go to college and start learning there. And um, then just basically auditioned for a lot of the melodramas for some reason when I, was, when I was younger. I got involved in a certain melodrama and I got into the melodrama circuit and bounced around all over the West for, gosh, 20, 25 years. Were you in any of those performances, I'm thinking this is not in the West, but in Bardstown, Kentucky, for example, they do the Stephen Foster uh, summer show because yeah. that's where my old Kentucky home is. Yeah. Were you yeah. doing things like that? Uh, yes. I mean, it, it, the, there's quite a few different melodramas in, in the West part. I mean, California and Alaska and all, all over the place. And they all have their different styles. They all have some kind of a, another pre review show or oleo show or vaudeville show. And uh, I would guess the first place in Oceano, California, the first melodrama, first professional theater I worked at, they, that was my first hint of what a vaudeville was. It was like a half an hour show after the melodrama. Mm -hmm. And go, go ahead. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, last night, I was listening to a digital recording I brought along with me of the Campbell Playhouse, which was the Orson Welles Wheatley sponsored show. It was non-sponsored oh, right. to start with. And then after the brouhaha over the adaptation of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds, right. Campbell said, okay, we'll sponsor this. Because CBS had just put it on sponsor less because the head of CBS, William Paley, thought that that needed to be on radio. But they did Showboat. Huh. And in Showboat, he uh, Orson Welles yeah. is not only the narrator, but he plays Captain Andy. And there are some scenes in there where they're showing the melodramas that were presented on the showboat. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. really interesting to hear that style of acting. We would call it over the top Absolutely. probably now. Absolutely. But, but yet, for the audiences of that time, it was their television. You're exactly right. I've got, I've got some really interesting stories from a gentleman I worked with in Cripple Creek, uh, Colorado. And Cripple Creek, had, at the Imperial Casino Hotel, 
has had the oldest melodrama, true melodrama, not melodrama where we're making fun of everything, but true melodrama. And the guy that directed me at that time, he told me he always played the bad guy when he was younger. People were so into those shows at that time that they would throw things at him. They thought he was really doing these mean, horrible things to these women and these men. They would throw ashtrays at him, and they hated him around town. They did take it very seriously. But that's the best compliment you can pay an yeah. actor if you think he's doing the, you know, the real stuff right. rather than just acting. Right. Is vaudeville, and I'm not mistaken, it's a French word? Or do you know where, where did it come you know, from? It is a European word. It came over and it actually was, was pronounced differently. And I can't mm -hmm. remember when I first learned it. It, it had an interesting uh, tongue. But then uh, we Americanized it, of course. And I'm not sure why they stuck with that unique word. Maybe it's just because it was such a unique word. But it was used specifically to provide entertainment for the masses. Yeah, I'm jumping the gun here. Back, back to your career. You started finding these melodramas yeah. out here in the West. Tell yeah. us about some of those. Boy, I mean, every place I worked had to get a different style. And some of them were making fun of it and over the top, and everybody booed and hissed and had all these at it. You know, it was, it was sometimes very interactive. And then, like in Cripple Creek, it was very sincere. It was true. It was honest, extremely emotional. And you were very dr over dramatic, hence the word melodramatic. Um, but there were quite a few. It's surprising how many there were and how many people enjoyed seeing those and getting involved. It was such a unique style from back, you know, 100 years ago when those really came out were very popular all over the country. And the reason why they had such a melodramatic, over-the-top style is because there wasn't any TV. Nobody was watching TV, mm -hmm. at the, you know, a lot. And you then. had, movies, you without know. microphones, you had to act, project, talk yeah. to the last row out exactly. there. And so you, you couldn't really be a natural actor. Because nobody you, or you could, could you? You know, you you really couldn't. And but if the, you were on the, the showboat with all the noise outside right. and everything, yeah. it was way over the top. But the emotions were sincere. What I enjoyed about it is that I just took whatever emotions I normally would feel for this character and just make them five times bigger, and just let your normal actions just be so much stronger. And some people say that's why I'm overly dramatic all the time. Well, now how did you find out about these? Be because when I was in Central California for a while, mm -hmm. I got active just as a, a backer of the local theater, which was a semi-professional theater mm -hmm. company. And apparently, because there were people there from Boston and Florida and Oklahoma, there were national, probably now the Internet, but there were national publications where you could find out who was doing what where mm. to, to audition. Is mm -hmm. the, did you find out, was it word of mouth? Um, it was actually, uh, uh, they, they still do them today, and this was, again, uh, 30 Years ago, thirty years ago, you were a child then, and I was uh, I was in my early twenties, and um, they had what they call them combined auditions. You could go to New York, and there would be theaters from all over the country, and they would all plan this a year, you know year in advance, and they would uh, all sit in the theater, some theater somewhere in New York, and they would have all these performers. And so you'd these, have a theater full of managers, full or, or of of theater owners and managers, talent bookers, and talent exactly. And you go and you just do your one audition, and they go, and they look at your resume and they say, well, I want to audition, you know, I want to, you know, and they you can you can hit everybody a whole bunch of different theaters in one audition time instead of going all over the country to hit them. Wow. They have they're called the NETCs, the the Straw Hat auditions, and they've been around for years. And it's a great way to just kind of get out there and do this audition and see if anybody wants you. And it was a very successful trip for me and. Uh, I just love the idea of working in Pismo Beach for a summer and enjoying my summer. And Do you have clams? <laughs> yeah, well, I brought plenty of clams. You have, isn't, it, isn't it clams? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Pismo I was going to say yeah. Pismo. When you yeah. hear Pismo Beach, everything, yeah. you've got to go there and eat clams. Clams. Clam okay. chowder. Uh, but they had a great little melodrama there, and it had been around a while, and it was doing five or six shows a week, and I was this young pup, you know, pup just going in there and, and got a really great start in this whole melodrama circuit and just bounced from place to place to place and just learning as much as I possibly could. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but <laughs> at that age, you probably wanted just to work for board and room. Almost. It was almost working that. I mean, I made a whole $250 a week and had to pay rent. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. Well, at least the, the theater I was talking about <laughs> in California, they, they bought an old three-story house and made a communal house yeah. out of it for the people who'd come in. I'm yeah. sure that's, that's been done yeah. elsewhere. And that can be done all over the place. This yeah. is just this Was there one melodrama you did that was your favorite? A, a specific melodrama, it, you know, it, or the it, place you had the most fun in, at that point you know, in your life. I think the place where I, w I stayed the longest, where I learned the most. Where, to be honest with you, where I learned vaudeville. It was at the Vaudeville Express Melodrama 
in Osh in um, Oildale. It, Oildale, it was, which is Bakersfield. Bakersfield, yeah. of all places. Mm-hmm. And um, some friends of mine had started it up. And did you it, eat at Hodel's restaurant? I do remember the name. I'm sure I did. I was there off and on for eight years, yeah. Well, if you were in Oildale, I can now tell you where I was. (laughs) Merced. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah. between Modesto and uh, and Fresno. Yeah. I'm not proud of the fact I spent five years in Merced, but that's that's where I was. At least it's not Bakersfield. And and I don't mean to knock it. Well, unless you're Buck Owens, you don't want to be... (laughs) That's right. In Bakersfield. The air wasn't great, and it got extremely hot in the summertime. Oh, yeah. So I would usually go, and I, would, I didn't want to work there in the summer, so I'd come to and work the winter season, and then I'd go to other places and work the summer, like places in Colorado, Virginia City, Montana, up in Alaska, and all these other places in Durango. And I just bounced from place to place to place. I worked in 15 different melodramas. Wow. And but at least in Bakersfield, you're only two hours from L.A. That's true. So you can escape if That's you've got true. gas money. That's true. That's the other thing. And we did quite often, and they actually would bring up some performers occasionally from L.A. to work some of the bigger parts and stuff like that, and I got to work with some good people. Where, when was it that you really settled down the first time? Here. Here. Yeah. Fifteen years. How'd ago. you find out about theater here? I was working at Boulder's Dinner Theater, uh, Boulder's Dinner Theater in Boulder, Colorado, obviously, and and um, I, it was it. I don't know how to explain it, but basically, it was time for a change for me. Uh, I'd worked at a place long enough. I hadn't lived in one place for longer than six months my entire adult life up until. I moved out here, to be honest with you, because I was bouncing back and forth all over the place. And then I heard about this place called the Crystal Palace up in Aspen. It had been around for 60 years. And they did political, current event, comedic, vaudeville type stuff, that kind of that era, that kind of but style. But a different twist on it. Much better. It's yeah. like the Capitol Steps, if yeah, you're okay. familiar with them. That kind of style. Very popular place. And the people made a lot of money there because it was in Aspen. And the, the people that came to see the shows were very wealthy, and they would just throw money at the, at the cast. And <laughs> they made a lot of money. So I got a job out there for the summer. Yeah, yeah the Capitol Steps is a wonderful example of that kind of semi-improv, satirical Yeah. Sometimes over the top. Yeah. There was another show in, in, they're from D.C., there was another show there called The Hexagon Show, there which was. I used to write for. Really? And it, it was a yearly review. It only ran for one month every fall. Huh. But the neat thing about it is a lot of the newscasters in D.C. would come and do newscasts. Oh, neat. Which were fun to write. Yeah. Because it was all wrong. <laughs> that was, <laughs> that was all it was great. my opportunity to not be factual when yes, I, when I was writing. Yes, just to be creative and make stuff up. So you, you came to Colorado, and how yeah. long did the first gig last? <laughs> it's really or funny. do you want to talk about it? It's funny you it. ask that. That first gig lasted about probably two months because I broke my collarbone snowboarding. That oh, no. And it took me out for two months. By the time I came back in, I worked for another month and a half, and the season was over. And um, So you missed the middle part of the season? I missed the middle part of the whole season. I never really I'm surprised they let you back. Well, they, I think they felt obligated. Poor yeah. guy broke his collarbone. He came all the way out here. Let's please put him back in the show. And I was back in as soon as I could get back in. And then that kind of ended right there after that first season. But I loved the Valley so much, and I got involved in just every theater that was here, directing, choreographing, I mean, tons of musical theater, and uh, uh, with uh, high school kids and uh, just involved in every aspect of different theaters here. And kind of got a reputation, and then I kept looking at Glenwood Springs, saying, "Man, I, uh, that's that's where I can really credit all the melodramas I worked at, is because I learned from where they all were. Some of them were in tiny little podunk towns. Do you think there's not 50 people in this town that are going to support this thing? But there were tourists all over the place. There were campers. There were always people looking for something to do at night, and the place would pack out. I'm going, good grief! So you don't have to be in the big city to make something mm-hmm. survive and do well. You just need to find a place where there's tourists looking for something to do. And the other thing about theater that I discovered up in Central California, at least in this group, is that if you're not acting, you're making sets or you're painting, sure. or you're learning uh, to be an electrician, yeah. that I, th- I think a lot of people forget the enormous amount of work that goes on before the show starts. Absolutely. I mean, months out, Absolutely. and behind the scenes when the show is going on itself. Especially when it's a large production. A lot of invisible people. 
Absolutely. That can be a crew, and that's actually where all your cost is. Your cost is in producing and creating the shows and all the people involved that you have to give salaries to to build sets and design and salaries of all that. And that's, that's be honest with you, the reason why I do this type of a show here is the cost of, of not needing necessarily all those people is extremely low for these kinds of shows, and they're very entertaining. Now, you hear about Glenwood Springs, and, and I have told my host here that when I told friends that I was going to take this long circular road trip and go to Glenwood Springs, a couple of them said, you won't want to leave. <laughs> and I have found this place really endearing. Yeah. Now, I live in Palm Springs, California. It was 109 when I left. It's dry. There are no plants. It's all sand, and it's flat. Yeah. There could not be a place as opposite yeah. in the world yep. as Glenwood Springs yep. is. Yeah. But it's it's tucked in this wonderful T shaped valley where mm-hmm. one river flows into the Colorado. Right. And it's ju- there's just kind of a homey. Did you sense that when you first came here? Well, what I like about it is, is the size. It's big enough but not too big. Yeah. And you don't have a lot of the big city issues. Uh, and yet there's some things you kinda of miss. You go to Grand Junction or Denver for I like the, just the combination of things. We're, we're almost in the heart of the Rockies right here. It's just such great um, access to so many different parts of, of the beautiful mountains and up to Aspen and what. And I have been coming uh, on this trip to document highways. Hmm. The most incredible part of I-70 yeah. comes over here from Utah and yeah. goes through Glenwood Canyon. I mean, yep. you wouldn't think an interstate highway would be anything other than functional. Absolutely. But it's every two seconds there's another photograph. I will never say. forget the first time I rode a motorcycle from Colorado over I-70, over Utah, thinking this place is spectacular. I've got to come back here and check this out. Yeah, you, you wonder what the American Indians thought when there were no highways, no telephone poles. Yeah. They hadn't cut Vs through the ridges to get the roads through. Right. And when it was just the way God put it there. Yeah. You know? I mean, I, uh, it's impossible to describe how pretty that part of Utah is. Yeah, yeah. And many, many parts of Colorado, obviously. Yeah. That's what it's known for. I actually. remember the first time I came to Colorado, I went up Trail Ridge Road, which mm-hmm. I must tell people is northwest of Denver, up to Estes Park. Mm-hmm. And it's the highest U.S. highway in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And I drove and drove and drove. And I hadn't gotten out of the car yet. And I must have had the air conditioning running. And I remember stepping out and almost falling over because there's no air <laughs> yeah. up there. It's about 12,000. There was a sign that said Pancake Summit and a hand pointing. And I look over and there's a mountain. And then it said 134 miles. And I remember standing there thinking, I'm looking 134 miles yeah. across there. Yeah. The uh, the dimensions out here are enormous. Yeah. yeah. So, so you find out about the job. Now, at the time, it was not in this theater, was it? No. This, T- this. Tell us about those first days, and then we'll get to you deciding yeah. you want this to blossom into something. Those first days uh, for this theater? To come to, come no, to, to, come to Glenwood Springs. Glenwood oh, Springs. boy. To be honest with you, I had some partners at the time, and we tried three or four times to get into other buildings, to make it work, to get investors. They wanted to go pretty big, you know, lots of money and go whole hog. And um, I kept telling myself, I don't think it, this Glenwood Springs and the tourism here could support something that big, that expensive, that extravagant, five nights, five shows a week. Let's keep this thing simple. And so I opened up, actually. I went into the Masonic Lodge, one block over here, that had a theater in the middle of it that they never used. The building was really having a hard time keeping in shape, and they didn't have the money to do it. And I went to the president of Masonic Lodge and said, I've got an idea to put this show on the stage and try and bring some people in, and you can bring some revenue in and, and, and work on your building and keep it in good shape. Well, I was there for four and a half years, and it's grown and grown and grown every single year. I started this business on 30 grand. That's it. And then worked three jobs for three years just to try and keep it going. This was, all of them were part-time, and I was constantly working. And then uh, and then I thought, it, it got to that point where the Masonic Lodge not only wasn't big enough, it didn't have what I needed uh, power-wise, and so many aspects of it. Yeah, most of those old theaters, and a lot of people may not realize them, the Masonic Halls, Odd Fellows Lodges, even yeah. Knights of Columbus sometimes, yeah. had a theater in them. Yeah. I mean, that was part of the way you built those social clubs right. in the old days. But you're, you're right, it probably would not, it would have been obsolete in many ways yes. to do very much with. And maybe a, a fire trap. 
Yeah, it was. Uh, we got away with a lot over there. We really <laughs> did. And a lot of things I did not get away with here. And, and this was still a operating uh, movie theater. Well, I understand, before going on the air, yeah. my host told me that this was the last downtown theater. And because it would have cost too much to convert from film to digital, right. it went black. Right. And did it, you then say to yourself, aha? No. No? It was... It's very similar, but basically, I knew John Buxman. I knew this theater was doing okay. Now, John I, was... John, John Buxman is the... Excuse me. He's the, he okay. was the, the, the movie theater owner, okay. and he still owns the building here. And I knew that uh, they weren't putting a whole lot of effort and energy into the theater. It really needed a nice facelift. It really did at the time. It was all stadium seating. It was a classic theater, and everything you see here right now is brand new. None of this was here a year ago. And... Um, it, and I knew that he was going to have to go digital. Well, he was planning on going digital. He didn't want to spend the extra hundred, hundred fifty thousand dollars to do that. I called him out of the blues. I said, John, I got this idea. What do you think about me maybe renting the place out from you and putting my vaudeville in there? And, he, and he, the direct words out of his mouth was, "You are very smart to call me right now because he was really at a crossroads. What do I do with this building? He didn't want it to be a retail shop. He didn't want it to turn it into a bunch of offices and stuff. He was very passionate about this remaining a theater. And he also didn't want it to necessarily go digital and, the up and everything that went with it. And he has another movie theater out in Moab that was doing much better. So we still had the building. We worked out the situation. I said, I'll gut the place out and start from scratch and, and redesign my whole place and we'll make it work. You think of the life that happens inside a theater and this is a perfect size that people at home can't see it it's not a big theater no it's a lot, little bit larger than intimate but it's it's yeah. an it's an okay yeah. size without it it probably suits you very well for well, what you're doing extremely well i literally designed every inch of this thing i sat and, and sat in front of plans and designed everything out for just weeks and weeks and figuring out how many seats i could get in here where the aisles are going to be is there enough room i came out here i'd measure things for hours and hours trying to make this thing work and because we serve food we wanted tables we wanted people to be comfortable so we seat 160 people they're all very comfortable they get to see and hear everything and they're there, people honestly say there's not a bad seat in the house. You mm -hmm. can sit, they, some people request the very back seat because they say they can see and they like it up there. It's now, crazy. you've taken the tilt out, so you have a lower section and a higher section. Right. So it's kind of divided in half. Yeah. That would be nice, that back seat up there. You know, we do have people sit back there, and they're perfectly fine. They see and hear everything great. Yeah. So... You you talked to the owner of this building at the very moment he was trying to decide what to do. Right. How long did it take you to realize that dream, I guess, to get from that point to opening night? About a year when I first spoke to him. But there was obviously massive negotiations and figuring everything out and making sure it's what we both wanted to do. And it was about a year until we actually opened up, up the first show. But... Be honest with you, it was really an insane time when we, because I had a very small window to turn this place into what I needed it to do. It was, it was actually a crazy moment where we hadn't even signed the contract yet, and we were already tearing things apart. There were so many, I was like, I have to make this happen. We have to do this. this the, the, the contract has to work, and so therefore I'm putting all my faith that it will. It was terrifying. <laughs> what was opening night like? What was the show opening night? The show was our holiday show last year, and we have we do un, basically unthemed vaudeville shows. It's just a mishmash. So it of is crazy an oleo. Insanity. Is that is that is that the proper word? It's there's many words for it. It's it <laughs> it really pastiche. Yeah, there's oh. oleos, reviews, vaudeville. I like the word vaudeville because vaudeville means anything. Old yeah, re right review to me, and it may have a wider meaning, is a show consisting of pieces of other shows particularly if it's a musical review. There's no original music for it, usually. For, uh, for, for our show, we have tons of original music. Oh, we, good for you. We parody a lot of things. We take, we, <laughs> you got to see it, right, man? Fans not, he said, you, our shows are just so crazy and so creative and nutty. I don't know how else to explain it, but there can be skits. There can be a skit next to a blackout, next to jokes, next to uh, a song, next to a tap number, next to uh, dancing plungers. I, <laughs> well, for I mean, those who are old enough, 
there was a television show, which I always thought was modern day, if you can call the 50s and 60s, and that was the Ed Sullivan Show. There would be everything from the top tenor at the Metropolitan Opera to a dancing bear. Yeah. On that show. Yeah, exactly. And it worked, though. The Ed Sullivan was a vaudeville show. Yeah. It was the same idea. Vaudeville shows were acts, acts of anything, acts of animals, magicians, uh, jugglers, comedians, singers, dancers, anything that entertained. And they would throw it in this one lump of two or three hours of just entertainment. And the audience didn't know what was next. And they loved it because, oh, that was great. And then on to something completely different. And, and that's what we really try to create here. But we use more of a troop, a core of people to do that. Let's talk a little bit, uh, go back a half step and, and yeah. talk about what were called the circuits on vaudeville. Now, I'm pretty lucky. I wasn't good friends with Bob Hope. But we were on first name basis. Nice. And uh, matter of fact, I want to tell you what he said about vaudeville. But I, uh, the first time I sat down to talk to him, he said, where are you from originally? And I said, I'm from Vincennes, Washington, Indiana. He said, ah, Vincennes, Washington, Shoals, Bedford, <sighs> North Fernon. I can remember. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, that was the cheapest vaudeville circuit. Mm. So that's where I started mm. out. Mm-hmm. And he said, that was 1920 or whatever it was. But he said, we would play that circuit and then play that circuit again and, the, and he basically said, I could do the same routine three times a day, seven days a week, until I got it right. <laughs> and then, I hopefully, did. I could go to the next bigger circuit, mm-hmm. which would have been Bloomington, Dayton. you know. Right. And, of course, everybody, the phrase was, you want to play the palace. Right. You want to get to that, what would it be, Chicago, Cleveland, New yeah. York yeah, back the around circuit. You bet. circuit. That was yeah. the hot. That was when you really were doing well, and you got paid really well. And you were the best performers at the time. But vaudeville for the performers must have been tough. Get on the train, get up, go. You know, do, where are we today? I think that kind of thing was tough back then. I think they were so darn fortunate. Heck, I'm actually getting paid to entertain people, and we're so we're so spoiled nowadays. Life was so hard back then. That was a probably a fantastic job. Travel. Yeah, you know, well, you're right. Yeah, I never it's looked just, at it that way. It was probably very hard, but... And the industry that I'm in, radio, the early days of it were actually a child of vaudeville. If it had not been, and the first person I mentioned, Ed Wynn, the first major entertainer who was willing to go to radio, who realized I can be play to more people in yeah. one night yep. than I'm playing to people, was Ed Wynn, yep. who came over. And but every early star was vaudeville and knew how to project into those old microphones. And that's exactly why that mural is over there, is to let people know. Explain that, if you will. It's the outside of the building. On the outside of the building, there's a 100-foot by 35-foot tall wall, the big, brown, ugly wall that faces the parking lot. Well, so many people have asked me for years, why vaudeville, what is vaudeville, What, what does that all mean? I explain that to them, and people just don't realize what vaudeville was at the time. It was the movies, movies, going out to see the movies or sitting at home and doing your TV. I mean, you went to go see the vaudeville show. They were coming in every couple of weeks. It was the big, hot event. And um, there were all those early movie stars were on the vaudeville circuit. The comedians, the dancers, the singers, the magicians, everybody, where they were all started in vaudeville. And then when the, when the movies came out, they all went from vaudeville to the movies, the Marx Brothers. And so on this mural, what I did is we have all these pictures of these classic, uh, uh, familiar, famous people that everybody knows. Uh, and they, but they don't know that they were from the vaudeville circuit, and that's where they came from. So what I put up there at the very top of the mural, it says classic vaudevillians, and there are all these famous people, well, back in the day, famous people that sure. we all know. And actually, you mentioned Bob Hope and Red Skelton, and mm-hmm. those were two people on my list that I thought, well, I don't have quite enough room for everybody that I wanted to put on there. Yeah. But Mae West is out there. Yeah. W.C. Fields, yep. is that the Marx Brothers, of course. Yep, Marx Brothers. And even the Three Stooges. <laughs> Funny guys. I, w- I, w- big. I would have liked to have known Mo. Yeah. I hadn't asked this yet, but let me ask you this. What is the difference, basically, between burlesque and vaudeville? Burlesque was more of a saloon show. Women would come out and they would... You know, show so when I think of strippers, parts. in a way, burlesque would be the place. Right. Vaudeville but- was family. 
Vaudeville was exactly vaudeville. Was so if you went to a vaudeville show, you, you knew you could your take kids, your grandkids. You'd see magicians. You'd like I said, we'd see all these things. They're all family clean, and, and and all the the comedians were clean and stuff, and they just had fun. And you go to see a burlesque show, and you'd see the raunchy part of it, uh, and the strippers of that day, which really didn't strip all the way down. They just showed more of their body parts and whatnot. And there's actually some burlesque shows that it's more of an artistic thing now, historical thing. What you know is as. as uh, as Cole Porter said, in olden days, a glimpse of stocking yes. was looked on as something shocking. Right. What What was the heyday? Can you define the years of the popularity of vaudeville? And did radio kill it? Uh, no. I think I think movies, probably radio and movies combination. But it was the turn of the century. Yeah. It was. It was really. Uh, it was amazing. I mean, eight, eighteen fifty. We went kind of that early. So pre-Civil War. Yeah, 1850 yeah. all the way through And that's 1930s. when you had the showboats. Yeah. In, in that era, yep. plying mostly up and mm-hmm. down the Mississippi. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, you had the movies early in the 1900s. Talkies by 26. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the handwriting mm-hmm. was on the wall. For yeah, and hence, it's, it's funny you bring that up, because that's why I have that certain photo player up there right now. It had to do a lot with when the talkies came out. That it kind of these, these were specifically built for the early movie theaters to provide the music and the now, sound effects. Now, tell us what you're talking about yeah, here. I apologize. Not everybody's here, obviously. He's going to play but, it after a while. Yeah, up, up above the stage. There's the main stage, and I have all this room up above it, and there's a very large, what looks like, a large piano with two very large boxes on each side. And it's kind of a, a pretty uh, car- carpentry piece. And it says Wurlitzer on it. It's a photo player. It was built in 1918. And a photo player, and this is my spiel that I say during the shows when I explain it to everybody, because everybody always asks, is basically the movies came out. When they came out, they had no sound. They were the non-talkies. Well, you don't want to sit in a theater and with no sound and have this completely dead, dead theater and just reading subtitles up there. So they built very specific instruments. These automatic instruments provide the sound effects and the music for those early non-talkie movies. Those, you know, I'm not sure if you've heard the term, but the very, very first movies were called photo plays. Because mm-hmm. when you play, right, you, you play right. a bunch of photographs in a row, and that was the first movie that came out. So that was actually a very common term back then, was the word photo play. So when they built these specific instruments to provide music for those early photo play movies, they called it a photo player. I am picturing the credits for the original uh, Ten Commandments or King of Kings, and it said a photo play by whoever the director, whether it was DeMille exactly. or, or D.W. Griffith or whoever. Yeah, I've seen that right. word used before. Also in so the, this is a, an, an organ, it is but it's got levers organ. and stuff? Exactly. It's a type of organ that has a ton of sound effects that you would actually play during the movie. When you see a bunch of horses going up and down the street out there, you push a darn button, and it pushes the air through, just like an old player piano, and you hear horses going, or you hear a <laughs> siren, or you hear a klaxon, which is the old Model A horns, and all these different sounds. It's just so wacky and obnoxious and fun. Uh, and I play a bunch of stuff in the show because it's from that same vaudeville era. Our show is about as wacky and crazy as fun, and it gets everybody in the mood. It works really well. I always thought it would be incredible if you're a kid in the days of the silence in a town of, say, five or 6,000, where it's a piano player playing the soundtrack mm-hmm. and making a few sound effects, mm-hmm. to then, for example, go to Indianapolis or Chicago where there's a Horlitzer organ mm-hmm. in the theater. Mm-hmm. What a different spin yeah. on this. Or, you know, the original Ben-Hur with piano. I just can't, yeah. I can't imagine Yeah, that. Yeah, it, 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 it would just be... And that's, and that's why they did this. There's so many different sounds coming out of here, and there was such control of, of it. It was amazing. It's, it, it, uh, what they did with it to create all these... Uh, what am I trying to say, um, intimate moments with music and stuff. It was really incredible. There's two different role players up there. So you can have two different roles. You play one role, put a different role on, and just keep different songs going at different times during the movie. I mean, they'd have to really practice to get it right for that movie. You may know where I'm going here, but have you ever heard the phrase, if somebody is getting so pathetic, talking about, oh, my car doesn't work, and they'll say, stop playing Hearts and Flowers? You ever oh, heard that phrase? Gosh, it barely sounds familiar. I might Hearts and Flowers is da 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 da. Yeah, da, da, dramatic. Yeah, yeah it's really and it, they sad. would play it when the woman would be sobbing and everything. Right. It was called Hearts and Flowers. Yeah. So, but it was so dramatic, it became a phrase saying, "Well, don't play Hearts and Flowers." Yeah. <laughs> or the little thing where you make the violin on your finger. You know, it's yeah. 
Right, right, right. I don't want your sob story. You know, it's funny you you mentioned that. There was a term, a common term that we all know that I never understood until I got this, this, uh, the Wurlitzer photo player, pull all the stops out. Pull out all the stops, yeah. Yeah, yeah, pull out the stops. And I I never realized that until I was was up there and I was working with the guy that helped me bring it in. He says, okay, now pull all the stops out, which are all this. I know. That's where that came from. I, I never knew that. I remember I was still in World News when Lady Di got married. And we used pull out all the stops euphemistically, meaning, boy, they, that my birthday party. They, yeah. they pulled out all the stops. Exactly. When they, well, she's getting married, and the organist literally pulls out yeah. all the stops yeah. during the recessional. And I got to write into the story that the organist had pulled out all the stops. <laughs> because we were told in journalism school, you never use that phrase. Hmm, never. Really? Use, you can't say high noon, for example, in a news story. Because you can't say passed them. away. Interesting. They died. See, passed away is a cushy kind of soft word. Huh. Now, you'll see in newspapers, our dear beloved son passed away. Huh. Well, those people paid for that obituary. Uh-huh. You know, papers don't print obituaries very much anymore huh. for free unless the mayor dies. <laughs> then they'll put the obituary. Where did you find this thing? I actually, I found it online. I went to a broker. Uh, I got online. I found out. I found this incredible website where one man he he literally sells these. In, people go to him and say, "I want you to sell this instrument for me." He had hundreds of different kinds of things. This was the only photo player he had. I told him I had this crazy wacky show. I wanted something loud and obnoxious and fun and goofy. And he says, "I know exactly what you want." And, he and where did you friend. find it? Oregon. Oregon. Uh, in uh, uh, near Redmond area, but it was originally built for the Liberty Theater in Yakima, mm-hmm. Washington. And then when they, again... It's as big as a small bus. It's really quite large. It weighs 2,300 pounds. Now, how much restoration did it need? Um, I would say it was about at 80% when I well, bought it. Because I would worry that the bellows over the years would have rotted. It did, and a lot of work got redone by the gentleman who owned it. He passed away. Uh, and he, then it, d- he died. He, oh, excuse me. <laughs> that's right. He died. And, um, and then uh, we, uh, it sat for a couple more years and needed more work. And so when I bought it, I had a gentleman that knows the instrument work on it. cost me a lot, quite a bit of money to have him take it apart and do some more work on it, bring it out here. And then the climate climate difference between where they were there and where we are here, it's just changed everything. It's made it really difficult. So I'm, I've am i taken it apart quite a few times trying to fix things on it. And it's it's a little challenging, but it's it's also very, very fun. And you promise to play it after a while? Absolutely. Okay. I, I right. love it. How much of the impression people get of your show is based on this added layer using the photo player. To be honest with you, the photo player right now, it's, I, again, I've only had it 10 months. This business, business is still brand new. People come here to laugh. Comedy, comedy, laugh. To show me something unique and different. And uh, the photo player is the icing on the cake. The main body of the reason why people are here is to see this show. Does it have a slide whistle? Uh, it does not, but I do. You've used one. it many times, oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, and and basically, this is just an extra benefit. I bought it, but I, all the time, and what I really love, I'll be honest with you, after I play it, I come back out here, and it's usually the young guys, the, the 20 to 30-year-old guys, that say, that's really cool, man. Uh, that's really, I mean, they've never seen anything like it. And I would expect that from seniors or maybe from sure. children, but when the kind of the hard-to-please guys go, hey, that's really awesome, man. I like that. You Can know? I get one of those? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're all over the- <laughs> I, my understanding is there's probably fewer than 50 that are still in existence. There yeah, I have, I've never seen one before. They're very, I've very I've seen rare. large, restored Horlitzer Theater organs, yep. which are, if you can play one of those, yeah. it's, it's, it's out of control. Yeah, this is a player piano times 10, oh. and uh, you can do a lot of other things with it. So, You say it's got two roles right. where you can play one and switch over. That's kind of the way they do movies, you know, where they switch from one, 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 reel, one, to one reel to the other. Yeah, yes. exactly. Don't get me started on that little dot. At the top that tells you when to roll the second projector. Oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm apparently the only one of my friends who can see that. Huh. I'll see the first one. It. I'll be watching TV. I'll see the first one. Watch. There's a scene change coming up. Now watch, watch. It's going to cut to another camera. Three, <laughs> two, one. They look <laughs> at me and they the go, dot. you're crazy. Huh. That's a phenomenal. Uh, should I ask huh. what it set you back? Uh, you know, when I, was first, when I was first looking for them or, or I 
uh, when I learned about this one particular, and then I got online and started looking around, they were thirty to fifty thousand dollars. The one in re the ones in really great shape. There's one that was in one of the world's fair that's for sale right now. It's on its own trailer. You can pull it around. It is visually just spectacular. It's about twice the size of this. Two hundred thousand dollars. This one I got at a steal. She was asking thirty thousand dollars. I bought it for fifteen. I put another five thousand into it, and then getting it over here. So it's about twenty-two. Grand. It was like the last car I just bought. <laughs> My next wife. Have actually. to put a lot into it after you get it. Yeah, right. Exactly. No, I can see that really punctuating the performances. In the, your typical vaudeville show, what would we see? Huh. Or well, is there a typical show uh, here? Well, I'll be honest with you. I really, I try you know, when I when I build the shows. Obviously, what's most important is finding good, entertaining, funny, funny things, whether it's a skit, whether it's a song, whether it's a parody, whatever the gimmick is. Everything's got to have a gimmick. There's almost always an awesome tap number that has some kind of a concept or something unique about it. It's not just tap dancing, but there's this, this uh, something unique about this form of tap dancing. There's always... Um, one of the craziest things you ever saw where we have these mini baby bodies and we put our heads on them and we're all in black and we dance around and we sing all these songs but we sing parodies and baby theme songs and just weird unique stuff and the audience always comes in and goes are you doing the babies tonight? Are you doing the babies tonight? <laughs> you know, uh, they will see that. They will see giant elongated plungers dancing around on stage popping on the proscenium of the stage in a choreographed movement it's one of the craziest things. You've got to see it. It's hard to explain what it's all about. You'll see skits. You'll see usually at least one very dramatic song to show off the talent that we have here. Right now we're doing the real dramatic piece from uh, Miss Saigon called Buidoy. So some things are actually even modern. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want the audience to do is, I, I don't know what the heck's coming next. Am yeah, I people supposed to laugh or not? People come to you and say, I've got an act you're not going to believe. Sometimes. Uh, that can because happen. I would think most of the time they say that you don't believe it. Um, I don't, but people do come to me with <laughs> with stories. And if we have the time, I've got one of the craziest. Yeah, go ahead. This, this gentleman came to me, works up at the bed and breakfast uh, up Four Mile Hill. And he told me this story. He says, John, maybe you can write a song about this, but I thought it was pretty crazy. He says he, he put a Makita battery, an extra Makita battery in his pocket. And there was now, that's of, from an electric drill right, or an right, electric screwdriver or something right, like right. that. Right, right. It's a drill. It's a big battery. And it's it's got a battery power. on steroids. Yeah, right. Yeah. And he puts it in his pocket. And it's got a bunch of change in his pocket. And he's walking around up there, and he, he finds a little uh, a twenty two bullet, and he, and he put it in his pocket. And the spark hit the change, hit the bullet, shot the bullet right out of his out of his pocket. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> so I wrote this song, told the exact same story. I need you to help me with a song. I'm uh, Two days from now, I'm going to the Four Corners. Yeah. Never been to the Four Corners. And I can't figure out the motif yet, but each verse w ends with, at the Four Corners of the American West. <laughs> and I'm working on it. If, if you think you're going to die there, watch where you fall you might end up in a state with no services at all. Nice. But I can assure you, the insurance guys, boy, will they have a ball. Yeah, nice. At the four corners of the American huh. And yeah. I haven't gone anyplace. Unfortunately, I'm a lousy piano player, can't play guitar, but I can write sheet music. Yeah? I know how to write sheet That's, music. All you need is a gimmick. You need the so idea. So I need to find a guitarist and, and tell me how to take my... I don't think anybody's written a song about the four corners. I've never heard one. See? And uh, there's something there about being able to stand or touch all four stages. I'm also at the same working time. on a musical version of Ben Hur. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, what was it? The, uh, oh. They'll do it. I hey, hey, your mother and sister aren't dead. I told you that just to muddle your head. They're alive as two bell peppers living out their life as lepers. Hey, hey. <laughs> Can't figure out how to do the chariot race. <laughs> As a musical. That's pretty funny. That's, that's the problem. Well, we also have patter songs. I write a lot of patter songs, if you're familiar with Oh, they're with fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think of Gilbert and Sullivan. Exactly. The I, quintessential being, I am the very model of a modern major yeah. or anything from the Mikado. Is right, a, a right, patter song. right. Yeah. But I write them about Glenwood Springs. I actually wrote an entire commercial, a patter song about Glenwood Springs, about what I call a day in the life of a Glenwood Springs tourist. And it goes wow. on and on and on about all the things that a tourist can do in Glenwood Springs. You know who Stan Freeberg is? No, I don't. Well, if you don't, I, I, you, that's right. You're on the other side of yeah. theater. Freeberg sure. was the originator of the funny TV commercial. And he was asked to do a commercial for a company called Butternut Coffee. This guy's a cartoon, and he says, I'm going to show you what sublim sub 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 subliminal 
advertising is, I'm going to tell you a story, but it will leave you with the impression you should buy a product. So he says something about, I, I went into a dry cleaners one day, and this Rocky and Bullwinkle music comes up. Fireworks are blowing off in the background. An elephant walks across the sky, and it says butternut coffee. Mm -hmm. So this is his idea of mm -hmm. subliminal. But he went to Omaha, which is the headquarters of butternut coffee, and he wrote a nine-minute musical. It's got songs such as, Omaha moon keep shining. Huh. And it's a parody on the American musical. Huh. And you'll have to find it. It's called Omaha. Omaha. Yeah. You, you, may, got it. you may want to do one of the numbers. I'll look it up. It, from it. They, you never know. You see something and you get great ideas from stuff. What is the most rewarding thing about this so far? You're still in your second year, hmm. right? We're in our first year at the new building. We're in our sixth year Six. of the okay. business itself. The concept the is business. six years yes. old. I mean, the, the yeah. business has been in operation for six years. It started part-time and it's grown to this. Uh, most rewarding. Most rewarding is standing in the lobby at the end of the night, having some guy in his 40s who sat at this big, long 16-person table with his parents, his grandparents, or his kids. There's like four, sometimes even five generations all sitting, and everybody's laughing at the same time. And he comes up, he, uh, this has happened a couple times, but he came up to him, and he's still wearing the grass skirt that we put him in, and we threw him up on stage. <laughs> and he comes up, and he's almost in tears, saying, we had the best time. He was, just couldn't believe it. He came in, and this happens all the time, men come in expecting to not be very entertained, to think it was going to be lame or not very good or just not to be. And the wife dragged me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And they come out all the time going, I thought this wasn't going to be very good, and I'm going to tell everybody it's so much fun. I would guess in a city this size, and the population of Glenwood Springs is, what, 10,000? 10, 10, which is the size of, of my hometown. Yeah. That I guess word of mouth must be really important Huge. for you here. Yeah. Huge. We, every, reserve, every, every sheet of reservations that we get, we ask them how they hear about us. And there's always, my family told me about it, my friends told me about it, but, but even more than word of mouth, they bring other people, want to come, and they always bring new people. I mean, I see people two or three times for the same show, and they say, I had new friends in town, I had to bring them. I have my family in town, I had to bring them. How often do you change the, the lineup for the show? Three, three main vaudeville shows a year. Our holiday okay. show, our spring show, and our summer show. And mostly weekends? Yeah, okay. basically just weekends. Glenwood Springs is an international destination. Absolutely. What about tourists from out of the country, and how do they react? You know, not, a, not really a whole lot more yet. We're they probably don't know that. what it is. They, they don't. It's a foreign word to them, as it was to us. Glen, Glenwood Springs? No, vaudeville. Oh, vaudeville. Yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's hard. It, I'll be honest with you. Nowadays, uh, theater and people's entertainment um, expectations has, is much higher than it used to be. To get a lot of people nowadays to go to see live theater and think they're going to be entertained, it's tough. Uh, theaters are closing all over the country. Two of the most prominent theaters in Denver are shut down the last year or two. Wow. Yeah. Because if you were doing Death of a Salesman here, you'd die doing it. it. It would not sell. Yeah. People need to laugh. They need to come. They need to bring their kids. And everybody needs to laugh and have a good time. They just need to have it. This, our show is laughing meets hee-haw meets Carol Burnett. It's just Well, I, I can tell you here that he <laughs> has the, the faces, the, the masks of comedy and tragedy and tragedies crossed out so they're two comedies we add another comedy to it yeah that's that, no that's tragedy around right here that. john i'm going to let you go upstairs great and uh i want to hear how this darn thing sounds <laughs> oh, you will from up there <laughs> you bet john is making his way upstairs this is a, a kind of a an arc shaped semicircular balcony that sits over the performing area of the stage here at the proscenium you up there, John? I am, and usually I have a body mic on that comes through the sound system so everybody can hear me sing when I'm facing the piano itself because I'm my back is towards the audience. <laughs>
John, thanks for having us here. Absolutely. Thank you. Have you ever had so much fun? Well, it's easy at the Vaudeville Theater in Glenwood Springs, Colorado. And by the way, now you know how they made all those crazy sounds during Vaudeville and the silent movies on this week's American Montage. I hope you enjoyed this interview from my new American Montage series. Check out YouTube for more. I'm Dennis Daly.